Hello, hello everyone. My name is Paloma Beitelman. I'm here just to say a quick uh, hello to everyone who is joining now from different places. Um, we are here. Uh, this was organized by the Alumni Club in Chile. Um, um, as a leader of the club, I'm just saying hello, but I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce my uh, friend and a co-organizer that she has been most of the work of this uh, seminar that we have today, a great seminar with Professor Patricio Navia. So uh, let's welcome uh, Molly Denham and she's going to eat, make the proper introduction to this webinar. Hello, Molly. Thank you, Paloma. Um, good evening, and thank you everyone for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. Um, this session is going to be recorded just for your information. Um, on behalf of our alumni club here in Chile, um, I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Five Questions with Professor Patricio Navia, Politics in Pandemics, um, presented by the NYU Alumni Association and the NYU Alumni Club in Chile. Um, in Chile today, our entrance into the pandemic was led by a social uprising uh, that began in October of last year. Uh, this combination of events has led us to have many questions about what will happen in Chile uh, in our near future. Um, and so it only made sense to us as a, as a community to invite one of our very own members, Professor Patricio Navia, um, to lead us in the discussion about some of these questions that we have. Um, and we are so excited to have him. Um, and it is my honor to introduce Professor Navia. Um, Professor of Liberal Studies and Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University. Professor Navia is also a Professor of Political Science at Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. He earned his PhD in Politics from New York University, his Master of Arts in Political Science from the University of Chicago, and his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Sociology from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has been a visiting professor at Princeton, the New School, Universidad de Salamanca, Universidad de Chile, and NYU Buenos Aires, and a visiting fellow at the University of Miami. He has published scholarly articles and books and book chapters on democratization, electoral rules, and democratic institutions in Latin America. He is also a leading founder, founding director of Observatorio Electoral at Universidad Diego Portales. Uh, his books, Diccionario de la, la, de la Política Chilena, El Discolo, Conversaciones con Marco Enrique Ominami, Que Gane el Más Mejor, Las Grandes Alamedas, El Chile Post Pinochet, have all been bestsellers in Chile. He is a columnist in El Libero in Chile, the Buenos Aires Herald, and Infolatam.com. He has previously penned columns for La Tercera, Capital, and Poder magazines in Chile, and Perfil in Argentina. Um, being that the subject of our, women, of our webinar this evening is political in nature, we would like to remind all of our participants that the goal of this webinar is not to agree politically with our presenter, but to simply open up a rich conversation for our community. Both agreeing and disagreeing is encouraged, but we kindly ask that all questions and comments be respectful. If you do have questions during the session, please enter them in the question and answer box on your Zoom screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the conclusion of our program. So let's get started with our first question. Professor, uh, Professor Navia, good evening. Our first question is, what is the current discussion surrounding Chile's constitution? Okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. Um, but um, so I'm, I'm going to um, well, I, I'm, I'm glad to see some um, familiar faces and familiar names here. So um, hello, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. 
it's, it's a pleasure for me to be um, to be here with you. I just finished a meeting with um, my dean at NYU, and we are discussing how we are planning to return to classes in New York in a couple of weeks. So uh, this feels like a good introduction to what I will have to do um, both uh, online and in person starting in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, Chile's constitution is kind of a complicated, it's probably sort of the uh, most complicated element now of the way in which Chile made its transition to democracy. Because the constitution itself was put in place by the Pinochet dictatorship in 1980, and it has uh, been the constitution for the country for the past 40 years now. Um, when democracy was restored in 1989, um, the first few democratic governments were far more concerned with modifying the Pinochet constitution and eliminating authoritarian enclaves from the Pinochet constitution, which they did. Uh, the constitution has been modified more than 45 times, including uh, two huge sets of modifications in 1989 and then again in 2005. Uh, but um, after Pinochet died in 2006, uh, calls to write a new constitution began to emerge. And ever since the 2009 presidential election, the left has been calling on writing a new constitution rather than modifying the current constitution. Uh, since the um, street protests, the social upheaval of October um, 2019, a month later, uh, the opposition and the um, government coalition parties agreed on a process through which Chileans will decide whether they want to draft a new constitution. And that process was supposed to begin in April 2020 with a constitutional referendum, um, but because of the pandemic, that was delayed for October 2020. Um, Chileans are going to be asked whether they want to start a process and what kind of a constitutional assembly they will want uh, to elect. Um, if they vote, as expected, to start the process, um, then there will be an election for a constitutional assembly, if they choose that option, or an election for half of the members of the constitutional assembly, if Chileans choose that second alternative, in April 2021. Um, the constitutional assembly will begin its work probably in uh, late May, early June of 2021, and they will have a year or in the Chilean terminology, nine months extended or potentially extensible for another three months, so 12 months, um, to produce a draft of a new constitution. So by June 2022, we will have a draft of a new constitution, which will then be subject to another referendum, an exit referendum, uh, which will probably take place in August 2022. Um, if Chileans vote in favor, of that uh, constitution, then the new constitution will um, become the rule of the land, of the land in, um, by probably September 2022. If not, if Chileans vote against the proposal, then we return to the current constitution and we continue as if nothing happened. Um, um, in the meantime, um, Chile has presidential and legislative elections scheduled for November 2021. So the kind of unusual uh, situation in Chile is that uh, the new president will come into power in March 2022, but the new or the Constitutional Assembly will issue its constitution by June 2022. So the president will be kind of sitting there waiting for a new constitution to be proposed for about three months and, and all together about six months before um, the new president can actually sort of begin governing because um, everyone will be waiting for the Constitutional Assembly to finish drafting the Constitution. So the whole process is a bit of a complicated process, but it is the first time Chileans will have to um, decide on whether they want to um, start a new constitutional, uh, constitutional process. We can discuss uh, some of the um, details and the issues uh, at play here. But um, Chile, in that sense, is kind of following on the tradition, not necessarily a happy tradition, but on the tradition of, or a successful tradition. Um, but it is the tradition of Latin American countries. This region of the world is the region with the 
largest number uh, um, of constitutions. Um, on average, uh, there is a new constitution every three years in Latin America. So uh, this is a region that likes to write constitutions. And, and, and we think that um, constitutions are very, very important. And that's why we pay so much attention to them. But we also, um, unlike other countries, uh, believe that constitutions can be constantly reformed. And that's kind of an, uh, unique to um, Latin American countries. So in that sense, Chile joins the trend of writing new constitutions, something that um, has been part of the history and the tradition of Latin America. And, um, but in this case, uh, Chile will go through the process for the first time with a constitution that will be drafted by an elected assembly, unlike the previous authoritarian constitution of 1980 or the previous constitution in 1925, which was also uh, drafted by an elite group, not by an elected assembly. Excellent, I think that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned next year, um, Chile will be having presidential elections. Um, could you briefly explain for our audience the electoral system, but also how you think the elections will be impacted by um, our current health crisis and also the current political situation in the country? Okay, so um, Chile has a presidential system. Um, in theory, the Chilean president is very, very strong, but in practice, um, the strength of the president varies depending on who the president is. Um, so. Um, right now, our president is strong on paper, but kind of weak in um, sort of practical matters. But the Chilean political system is designed to be strongly presidentialist. Presidential elections take place every four years, concurrently with legislative elections. Um, so the next election will be in 2021 for president, for the 155 members of the Chamber of Deputies, and now for um, 27 members of the Senate. So the Senate will now have uh, 50 members. This is after a constitutional reform that uh, changed the number or the electoral system and the number of legislators in 2015. So that constitutional reform will be fully completed by 2021. And then we're going to write a whole new constitution, which highlights how uh, much we like to change the rules of the, uh, of the game. But we have a presidential system. Ever since democracy was restored in 1990, Chile has had two large coalitions, one center-left coalition, the Concertación, as it used to be called, or Nueva Mayoría, that ruled for 24 or 20 of the past, well, 24 of the past uh, 28 years, or past 30 years, and a center-right coalition, the Alianza, um, and now Chile Vamos, which uh, ruled between 2010 and 2014 and returned to power in 2018. One interesting note is that since 2006, uh, Chile has had uh, four alternations in power, uh, but only two presidents. Um, Bachelet from 2006 to 2010, a left-wing uh, president, then a right-wing president, Piñera from 2010 to 2014, then Bachelet again, and now Piñera uh, again. So we've had some continuity, but alternation, uh, alternation in power. Um, what will likely happen in late 2000 or 2021 is that there will be at least one right-wing coalition, but there might be more than one uh, left-wing coalition. In 2017, a new emerging farther left uh, coalition, farther to the left coalition, the Frente Amplio, um, was formed and, and also the Christian Democratic Party broke away from the old uh, Nueva Mayoría coalition and there were in reality three um, left-wing, well actually four left-wing presidential candidates in 2017. It shows a more fragmented political system than what we used to have um, in the past. But since Chile has a runoff system, a presidential runoff, um, we normally end up having one left-wing and one right-wing candidate in the runoff election, and that has been the case since 1999. Um, so um, there is fragmentation in the first round votes, which takes place in November. And uh, normally, since there is one left wing and one right wing candidate in the runoff, um, parties align along the old uh, left right divide that has characterized Chile since 1989. Um, but now, 
as uh, political parties are becoming even more fragmented, um, there are there is the possibility, there is the chance that there will be several um, uh, presidential candidates in the first round. And just like ha it happened in France a few years back or a couple of times in recent elections, uh, the runoff might end up having two right-wing or two left-wing candidates, we still don't know, uh, because no candidate is doing particularly well in polls. So candidates uh, fight over who's more popular, but in polls, um, the most popular candidate has about an 8 to 10 percent vote intention, which is pretty low. So it might be or it might be likely that um, we end up having several different candidates in the presidential election in 2021. Um, and the two that make it to the runoff uh, might not necessarily come from the left and right. They might be both right wing or both uh, left wing. Uh, uh, the presidential election, again, is going to be a very interesting election because at the same time as we have the presidential election, at the same time as a candidate's campaign, there will be, there will likely be a constitutional assembly drafting a new constitution. And that's kind of a new for Latin America. We've had a lot of constitutional assemblies, but we've never had a constitutional assembly constituted at the same time as um, a presidential election is taking place. Constitutional assemblies are normally formed after a presidential election has taken place when the new president takes office. This time around, we're going to have the assembly drafting the constitution and a presidential election, a presidential campaign taking place, which um, calls for a complicated combination because uh, presidential candidates normally make um, a lot of promises. That's what a campaign is about. And now we are going to have a constitutional assembly probably putting some of those promises into the constitution even before the president is uh, elected. So that anticipates that our constitution will look like a um, Christmas tree, or as I like to refer to it, a, um, and um, I, I forgot the name now, but I, I'll, I'll return to that, um, Ekeko, that's the name. Um, Ekekos are these um, Andean deities that are full of different things or like a Christmas tree. Um, and, and that's what I think our constitution will end up looking like precisely because it's going to be drafted concurrently with the presidential election campaign. Excellent, thank you. Um, so our next question is going to shift gears a little bit. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about how um, Chile's economy has been affected by the intersection of the social uprising and the global pandemic, which happened simultaneously. Right, uh, kind of sequentially, but, but they did happen um, kind of together. So, and, and that in fact presents a significant challenge for, um, for Chile because um, the economy um, suffered a significant slowdown with the um, social uprising, the estallido social in uh, October, and um, unemployment increased a bit, uh, economic activity declined, particularly the tourism and um, the, um, um, yeah, the tourism industry was uh, severely affected, uh, services uh, as well, restaurants, uh, the retail sector, were severely affected. Chile was scheduled to organize two big events in late um, 2019, um, the APEC summit and a um, environmental summit. And none of those uh, were organized or, or could be held because of the social unrest. And then um, in March, we went into a partial lockdown that has the real unemployment rate in Chile at, at about uh, 30%. So this is a, a very, very complicated scenario, both politically and economically for Chile. The situation is, um, hasn't been that bad ever since democracy was restored and we have to go back to 1982 when most of the audience probably had, was not even born um, for a time when Chile was in the middle of such a huge uh, recession. So this is a very, very complicated moment for Chile. Normally, um, the advice political scientists would give countries is that the worst possible moment 
to write a constitution is when you are in the middle of an economic crisis. Um, but uh, there is probably an even worse uh, moment, and that is when you're in the middle of an economic crisis and you are uh, holding a presidential election. So the two things, um, in putting those two things together and then writing a constitution is probably not the best way, uh, the best way to go about it. But, but the situation in Chile is very, very complicated. Um, it does highlight a problem that has been a typical problem in Latin American countries, and that is that the economies in Latin America are going cycle. Well, the world economy goes in cycle. But as Latin American countries are export-oriented countries, when the world economic cycle is up, then the Latin American economies grow very rapidly. That, that, that happened, for example, between 2002 and 2013, 2014 when we have a commodity boom. So the economies were growing very, very rapidly. But when the world economy takes a dive, um, then Latin American countries normally go in recession precisely because they stop selling quite as much in, um, in their export economies. And they um, have much more urgent um, financial needs. Some countries in the good years kind of save money in a rainy day fund and then they can spend the money in the bad years. And, and to some extent, Chile did some of that. But then we spent some of the money in the 2009 crisis and then in the 2010 um, earthquake. And now uh, we're probably going to end up spending all the money we have left uh, because of the pandemic and because of the social crisis. But since the economy will continue to take a dive for the next few months, the demands uh, will, social demands will increase, the government will have to start borrowing more money, uh, the fiscal deficit will increase, and eventually Chile will go through the same sort of um, usual uh, path Latin American countries go through, and uh, that will create a debt problem. A, um, the fiscal situation will deteriorate significantly, and um, that will increase um, interest rates domestically because the government, the state, will be borrowing money and that's gonna put pressure on um, interest rates and, and that will probably have some negative consequences in the long-term economy as well. So we're going to be in the down uh, cycle for a few years now um, and um, probably the social demands and the uh, fiscal uh, commitments the government makes and the state makes with the new constitutional process uh, will put us in an even worse um, economic situation. Thank you. Um, so I, those of us who have been following the political situation and the, the social situation um, in different countries across Latin America, um, we can see that there's lots of different things happening from Ecuador to Brazil could you give us um, an overview of how the situation in Chile compares to other Latin American countries in, at this moment? Okay, so every country is different, right? Um, but uh, I do want to make a point here. I, I, every time I go to Brazil or Mexico to conferences, there is always a professor that says, well, the exceptionality of Brazil, the exceptionality of Mexico. Um, uh, last year, I remember I was at a um, conference in Honduras and somebody said, well, the exceptionality of Honduras. And I said, oh, come on, wait a minute. I mean, not every country can be exceptional, right? Um, so every country is ex exceptional, then no country is uh, exceptional. Um, but Latin American countries share a common pattern. And, and I normally make this point to my students at NYU, and I've been doing this in my Latin American politics class uh, for uh, first year students since I started teaching at NYU in 2005. I tell the students that in, when I took my first class on Latin American politics in 1989 at the University of Illinois, I learned that um, Venezuela was the most stable democracy in Latin America. This was actually late uh, 1988. That was my first class and this is what I learned. Venezuela is the most stable democracy and the most developed democracy in Latin America. But Venezuela has three problems. High levels of inequality, it depends too much on um, one single commodity, oil, and it has an increasingly corrupt, distant, and ineffective political and business elite. But other than that, Venezuela is the most stable democracy in Latin America. And then every year from 2005 on, I 
stop my students at NYU that uh, Chile is the most stable democracy in Latin America today, but Chile has um, three problems, which are exactly the same problems that Venezuela had. High levels of inequality, it depends too much on one commodity, copper, not as much as Venezuela did on oil, but Chile still depends a lot on copper, and it has an increasingly corrupt and inefficient political and business class. Um, and then I remember in 2018, I told my students, well, in 1959, Cuba was one of the most developed countries in Latin America and uh, with high levels of inequality. It was not a democracy, but it had very high levels of inequality. And eventually, Cuba went into a downward trend that the country has so far not been able to recover from. Um, the same with Venezuela in, in 1989. So I said, well, maybe in 2019, another country in Latin America is due for some turmoil. Um, and I remember this because then I got an email in late October from a student that had taken my class in 2018 and said, ah, you were right, Professor, and it was your country, and Chile. Um, so there is a cyclical nature to what happens in Latin American countries. And uh, no Latin American country has been able to overcome that cyclical uh, nature. We can go back to the early 20th century and Argentina was the most developed country in Latin America at the time. And then it went into this uh, sort of vicious cycle that the country has not been able to emerge from. Um, so uh, there are some similarities to all Latin American countries. They are all commodity exporters. They all have very high levels of inequality. And it's not just inequality of um, income, it's also inequality of opportunity, inequality, on a num inequality in a number of different dimensions. I um, exemplify inequality at my NYU classes by asking students to look around the room and point to the person they think comes from the wealthiest family. So they look around and I tell them to mentally point, not to it physically because then I can get sued, uh, but they sort of look around and they start laughing. Um, they say, well, it's impossible to tell. And then I normally ask if there is a Latin American student in the class, uh, whether we could do that ex the same experiment in a Latin American university. And the students will immediately tell you, well, just tell me what university you want to do this experiment in, and I will tell you how much money their parents make. Um, so the levels of inequality in terms of inequality of opportunity that exist in Latin American countries are very high, and no country is an exception. And that, I think, is where the instability uh, lies. Um, countries that have a high or lower levels of inequality, countries that have a much bigger middle class, uh, tend to be more stable. The middle class is always associated with stability. In Karl Marx's words, um, the middle class has things to lose, whereas the proletariat has nothing to lose but their chains. So not surprisingly, the middle class will not join, will not strongly support a revolutionary change because the middle class has things to lose. And the problem in Latin American countries is that the middle class is not large enough. So given uh, the small size of the middle class, this process of revolutionary change uh, happen all the time. Uh, the bad news is that none of those processes has so far been successful. Uh, Latin American countries remain highly unequal. And those countries that are not unequal, those countries that have higher levels of inequality tend to be equally poor, right? Uh, Venezuela has a much lower level of inequality than, than Chile today, but in Venezuela everyone is equally poor, so that's, that's not the idea. We want to be equally wealthy, not um, equally poor. So um, levels of inequality in Latin America remain very high, and that I think is the main, most important um, defining characteristic of all countries in the region and the reason why uh, these countries have such high levels of um, instability. Thank you. That was very thorough and fascinating. Um, so our final question came from the participants. Um, the question that appeared most um, from our audience was, what do we think the long run impact of this pandemic is going to be um, on Chile as a whole, economically, politically, socially? What are we looking at from now, five years, 10 years? How do we think this is going to affect us in the long run? Okay, so experts on pandemics normally say that after the pandemic comes the war. 
right? Um, because there are um, fewer resources and there is competition for those resources. Uh, but those, those things happen sort of at the international level. Um, hopefully this time around we will learn the lesson as, as humans and we're not going to have a war, but, but, but who knows. Um, but in Chile, the impact of the pandemic is that inequality will actually increase. Uh, and the reasons why are pretty simple, right? So if you have assets or if you have your money on the stock exchange, um, your um, income levels have actually gone up. If you can work from home, um, you are actually saving money um, compared to what you um, were doing before the pandemic. But many people have lost uh, their employment. So the differences between the haves and the have nots will actually widen. And, and that's going to be true in um, all countries in the world, but particularly true in lesser developed countries. So we're gonna have higher levels of inequality. We're going to have a stronger demand for the public sector um, because of an economic crisis, but that will put pressure on the public sector to fund um, all the social programs it needs to fund. Um, this will likely weaken some institutions and make it uh, more difficult to attract foreign investors in the years to come. So uh, the prospects are not very good for developing nations, including, um, including Chile. Um, now, crises always offer opportunities. So um, this might be an opportunity for the country to start to correct some of the mistakes uh, it made in the past. Uh, but in order to do so, uh, there has to be some kind of a credible social contract. Um, um, Francis Fukuyama recently wrote a very good piece on uh, three conditions that are necessary for countries to overcome the pandemic situation successfully. So. And um, those three conditions, as you have to have some state capacity, so countries need to have a state capacity. A good example here of what not to do is Peru, right? So uh, in Peru, there is very little state capacity. So whatever the government does, um, doesn't really uh, filter down to uh, the streets because the state is just not present. And in many Latin American countries, the state is not really present. Uh, in some cases, the, the state is present through the military, as in Peru or Colombia, um, but in many places, the state can say something, um, but it's not going to happen because there isn't really sufficient state capacity. Even the more developed countries, Uruguay, Argentina, or Chile in the region have had problems with state capacity, particularly in the public health sector. Um, so, but that's the first condition, state capacity. Then there is a second condition, and that is government leadership. Um, so in Brazil, for example, there is some state capacity, but there wasn't sufficient government leadership and then Brazil has become sort of the center of the pandemic uh, in the world. Um, and uh, other countries, in Mexico, for example, there hasn't been very good uh, government leadership and, and the results are also um, pretty bad for that country. In places where you have had better government leadership, uh, think of Uruguay or Peru, um, things have looked better, and particularly when you have the combination of a state capacity and good government leadership. But then there is a third component, and that component is um, trust in institutions. And, and that's where Chile fails, right? Chile has some good state capacity, for better or worse, the government in Chile has been trying to respond to offer um, responses to the pandemic. So in Piñera can have a number of problems and difficulties, um, but he's not, a deni he's not in denial like, uh, like Bolsonaro um, has been in Brazil. But in, the problem in Chile is trust in institutions because people don't believe in the government and they don't believe the state. So the government can say so, uh, might say something and people immediately doubt uh, whether the government is being honest or straightforward. And absence of trust in institutions um, produces negative results in, in terms of response to the pandemic. So where you have countries with the three things, three checks, um, strong government capacity, government or state capacity, government leadership and trust in institutions, the results have been much better. In the case of Chile, we have a state capacity. Um, there is no trust in institutions or very low trust in institutions. And um, we have had some government leadership. So we have two of three, um, but the, the very low trust in institutions has probably been um, costly for the way in which uh, Chile has responded to to the pandemic. And I don't see how that can be corrected. Uh, when people don't trust institutions, it's like um, 
to some extent, losing your virginity. It's very difficult to go back, well, impossible, uh, to go back to a point where you are going to have a lot of trust in institutions. Building trust in institutions is not something that you do very, very um, easily. So uh, I, I think the prospects for Chile are a bit more um, complicated. Hopefully, Chile is not going to go down the path uh, Venezuela went uh, down to, uh, but then again, many people thought in 1989 that Venezuela could never uh, become the most uh, complicated country in Latin America because Venezuela at the time was the most developed country in Latin America. Um, the same with Cuba in 59, not a democracy, but still um, a well-developed country or Argentina in the early 20th century, or you can go back to um, one of the most developed countries in Latin America by the late 1700s. Haiti. Um, so um, we've had this cycle before, and uh, hopefully Chile will avoid it, but the um, signs are not very promising. Thank you, Professor Navia, for answering our five questions. Um, we would now like to open up questions from um, our participants. Um, so for those who have questions, um, I remind you that you can put them into the Q&A box. Um, our first question from the audience um, is, would you deem better to reform our current constitution or to draft a new one? Okay, um, that's an easy one. Um, all constitutions are, have a lot of similarities. Constitutions are like houses, right? Um, so you can be creative in the design, but the house, the house needs to have a bathroom, some uh, rooms, a dining room, a kitchen. Uh, it needs to have windows and doors. So constitutions need to have some, um, a very, very similar structure, right? Um, you need a chapter on rights, you need a chapter on how the presidential system will work, a chapter on how the legislative system will work. Um, the more flexible constitutions are better. Um, so the US Constitution or the uh, British Constitution, which is not even written, um, provides a lot of flexibility. And every year in the United States, we fight over how the Supreme Court will interpret the Constitution. And then we fight over um, uh, who will be a justice in the Constitution. And all the liberals are now very concerned about Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she's old and has cancer and we don't want her to die. Um, before the end of the year, because if she does, then Trump will get to appoint a new Supreme Court uh, justice. But if Biden wins, then the liberals will say, well, now we want a conservative Supreme Court justice to step down so that a uh, moderate uh, president can get to appoint a more liberal Supreme Court uh, justice. So in the US, the interpretation of the Constitution produces lots of problems, but Changing the constitution itself is not an option because it's a very difficult process and, and the constitution has been around uh, for a long time. So constitutions need to be flexible. The problem with Latin American constitutions is that they are very long. Um, and the even bigger problem is that every new constitution that replaces the old constitution tends to be longer than the previous one. And, and here I want to make a point about the Chilean constitution. It's a long constitution and it's very inflexible. That's bad. Uh, now, um, those that hope that the new constitution will be a minimalist constitution are really going against the trend in constitutions around the world. Everywhere in the world, in lesser developed and more developed countries, the new constitutions that have been drafted are always longer than the constitutions they replace. So, um, the idea that Chile could go into a, a constitutional process and come out with a minimalist constitution is something that I would really cherish, uh, but it's unlikely to happen because the history shows that every constitution has been longer than the, uh, than the previous constitution. So the, the debate over um, whether we should have a new constitution or just fix the current one, I think it's kind of a new debate. Obviously, it's better to fix the current constitution and make it a bit more flexible than try to start anew, because after all, uh, the constitution is going to be about 70% similar to what the current constitution has. The problem when you start anew is that some people start to get creative, um, and constitutions start adding things that are a bit excessive or perhaps impossible to, um, 
to uh, comply with. Uh, so for example, the uh, Constitution of Ecuador of 2007 talks about the rights of the Pachamama, right? So the right of the environment, um, rights of the environment. Um, and uh, the Constitution of Mexico City of 2016 talks about a um, vida sexual plena. I, I don't quite know how do you want to translate that, uh, but it guarantees people a, a fulfilled uh, sexual life, um, which is kind of unusual. What happens if you are not uh, happy? Who do you go sue at the state because you're not sexually uh, satisfied? Um, well, that refers really to gender, uh, gender identity. So I'm, I'm, I'm making perhaps a, a new point here. But, um, but the point I do want to make is that um, being creative in terms of uh, drafting a new constitution is probably going to generate more problems than it solves. Um, Carlos Fuentes, a Mexican intellectual, used to say that Latin American constitutions are more declarations of intent of where we want to be than descriptions of where we are. And so the constitution is our declaration of what kind of a country we would like to have rather than a description of the kind of country that we um, have and, and description of the rules of the game. Um, so my, my take is that uh, if we go through a constitutional process in Chile, we will end up having with an Ekeko constitution, we will end up with an Ekeko constitution. Um, and just to give an example, this is what I anticipate the constitution will say. Um, it'll have a chapter on um, property rights and it will say that the state has property rights over uh, mining property. They belong to Chile. Uh, yet, uh, there will be an article that says that uh, current contracts and, and treaties are to be respected. So property rights that uh, people will, uh, or companies will allow, will be allowed to exercise their current property rights. But then there will be another provision that says that um, um, the environment has to be protected and that uh, indigenous communities have to be protected and that um, um, sustainable energy has to be, have to be promoted. So the constitution is gonna have contradictory statements as to property rights for mining companies. Um, and that will lead to judicialization after the constitution is promulgated. So we're gonna have two years of uncertainty until we get the new constitution and then a long judicialization process where people fight over what the constitution actually means. Um, the successful cases of, constitution, of new constitutions in Latin America, the cases of Colombia and uh, Brazil, um, so forget about Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Think about the successful cases. Um, the successful cases led to judicialization after the constitution was promulgated. So I expect that even if the case of Chile is successful, and there is no guarantee that, um, that it will be, but if it were successful, um, then we'll still have a lot of uh, judicialization after the constitution is promulgated. So I understand why lawyers are so interested in having a new constitution, because this will give them plenty of uh, work after the constitution is promulgated, because there will be huge debates as to whether something is constitutional or not. Thank you. We have another question from our former alumni club leader until 2017, Uwe Sansani, who asks, what do you think triggered the public's loss of trust on institutions in Chile? Okay, um, so there's been um, declining levels of trust in institutions everywhere. Um, this is not just a problem for Chile. About 20 years ago, um, a, an American, um, sociologist um, Putnam um, wrote a book titled um, Bowling Alone. Uh, and in that book, uh, Putnam argues, um, Putnam also wrote a book before titled um, um, Social Capital. But in this one, uh, Bowling Alone, uh, Putnam argues that um, in the US, trust in other persons had declined drastically and people did no longer knew um, people no longer knew their neighbors, now they were just bowling alone. Uh, when bowling used to be sort of a family uh, neighbor um, activity. Um, so it's not just um, Chile that sees lower levels of trust. This is a trend um, elsewhere as well. Um, but I think the combination of um, declining um, levels of trust with high levels of inequality is kind of a very, very toxic uh, combination. 
So, and it's not just inequality the problem. The problem is also the absence of social mobility, right? So in the United States, we have high levels of inequality, but there is the expectation, more expectation than reality, but there is the expectation that you can have some social mobility. So you can move up in the social ladder, and, and that's uh, the American dream, right? So what uh, stands behind the acceptance of higher levels of inequality. As it turns out, the U.S. is becoming an increasingly more unequal country. I tell my students at NYU that in taking classes on Latin American politics, they're really taking a class on how the future of the U.S. Uh, will look like. And now the future has arrived. Uh, finally, the U.S. has a Latin American president in uh, Donald Trump. Uh, he reminds me a lot of uh, Nestor or Christina Kirchner taking on her Twitter rant or uh, Rafael Correa doing exactly the same. And now we have uh, the president of the United States fighting on Twitter with, uh, with different people. Um, so um, high levels of inequality, I, I think, affect um, the way in which trust in institutions has, uh, has substantially declined. And that um, is bad news for um, countries um, in Latin America. Now, uh, Chile, did, did see a decline in um, inequality levels. Chile is now less unequal than it ever was. So in terms of inequality, Chile was moving in the right direction. <clears throat> this was a patient that was doing better than before. Still in emergency care, if you will, but Chile has never been less unequal than it is uh, today. So all the people that say that Chile is the most unequal country in the world are just not basing their statements on facts. Uh, what it is true, though, is that given Chile's level of development, Chile was the most unequal country in that bracket of countries with similar levels of development. So Chile developed, but inequality did not decrease as, mass, as much as it should have. Um, so that's probably one of the um, things that Chile didn't do right. Um, and the absence of inequality makes it difficult um, to have social mobility, because uh, the problem when you have a small elite and then uh, the rest of the population in the low end is that you end up having a bottleneck that prevents uh, social mobility. And the absence of social mobility is bad for economic development. If I know that my kids will be better off and will retain the same position in society that I have, my kids won't have any incentive to work either because I'm at the low end of the distribution and they will not be able to move up or because I'm at the high end of the distribution and my kids are guaranteed that they will not move down. Um, so the absence of social mobility is bad for the entire country. And I think that also undermines uh, trust in institutions. Uh, when people become a bit better educated and they say, well, I did my part. I mean, I played by the rules, but I do not see uh, more social mobility. Discontent obviously uh, grows and it fuels that uh, perception that uh, things are wrong uh, in the country. Uh, the reaction, though, might end up being uh, or making the country even worse off. Um, so um, I, I jokingly tell my friends that eventually all Chileans are going to be nostalgic for Chile in 2018 and early 2019 because those ended up being the best years um, of the country. And uh, eventually, I guess, we will have a candidate that will campaign with a Make Chile Great Again slogan uh, because there will be a large enough number of Chileans that will remember the past and say we were better off in 2015, 2014, uh, you name it, that we were better off before than we are now. Fascinating, thank you. Um, our next question, what do you think about the tax on super rich that is being discussed by some in Chile? Yeah, I mean, taxing the super rich is the second most popular thing that anybody could do uh, in Chile. The most popular thing is nationalizing uh, copper or nationalizing um, lithium. Um, they just are not proposing that because Chileans mistakenly believe that copper is already nationalized. Um, so when we ask people in polls in Chile how much they think uh, Codelco accounts for all copper production in Chile, they tell us 70, 80 percent, when Codelco really accounts for about 27 percent of copper production uh, in Chile. So um, 
the other copper companies hide behind uh, Codelco and no one calls for the renationalization of uh, copper. But since copper companies are foreign owned, nationalizing copper companies would be the easiest thing to do. I expect some of that to happen and probably um, it will come together with the calls for the nationalization of water and, and potentially lithium um, as well. So uh, nationalization of foreign owned companies is kind of the most popular thing to do. Uh, but the other, the second most popular thing is to tax the wealthy. Um, now, if it were only so easy, right? Uh, taxing the wealthy, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, many of the wealthy people, particularly in Chile, uh, because of the tax structure, have their money in, um, in companies, not in actual, in their own personal wealth. Uh, so you would end up having to tax companies or having to tax wealth or, or perhaps even financial transactions rather than sort of taxing the wealthy. This idea, I'm kind of old. So this idea of, um, in, in Spanish, we would say Rico Macpato, right? This idea of um, um, Donald Duck's uncle that has all the money sort of uh, hidden into one uh, huge vault in his um, house um, is just not true. Um, so uh, the idea is going to end up be, being a useless idea because it's not going to produce the kind of revenues, uh, the advocates of that idea um, hope or believe or claim it will, uh, it will raise. And it will have negative consequences, right? Because uh, right now, a lot of people are saying, well, maybe I should take some of my money out uh, just in case, perhaps buy property elsewhere, uh, create an offshore company to hide uh, some of that money because they're coming after my money. So what Chile needs right now is incentives for people to invest in the country, not incentives for people to buy dollars and try to move out of the country. Um, in the uh, late 1990s, well, early 2000s, I remember very well when uh, Venezuela started to introduce um, quotas on how many dollars people could buy in Venezuela. Um, many um, wealthy people in Venezuela ended up sending their kids to um, universities in New York uh, because they could buy a much bigger quota if they had their family in New York. And so they started sort of stashing money um, outside um, of the country. And, and some of my neighbors in my apartment in Brooklyn are uh, Venezuelans and, and they did exactly that in, in the year 2000, in the, in the 2000s. And so um, cool people, nice people, but people react to incentives. And, and so I think placing a tax on the wealthy in Chile, it's popular, the second most popular thing, but it's not going to raise the kind of revenues that uh, the advocates of those, that, that idea claim. Excellent, thank you. Um, before we finish up, um, I'd like to ask a question that's, that pertains only to the NYU community. Um, how do you think, or what has been your, an ex, your what has, excuse me, what has been your experience as an NYU professor in the middle of the pandemic, and how the NYU community has been dealing with everything that's been going on? Okay, so um, I, I, as I told you earlier, I, I had a couple of meetings with my department, and um, it's kind of interesting how students and faculty members and administrators talk about different things, right? Uh, students talk about w when they will be able to make it to New York safe and start taking classes again with all the associated activities uh, to those classes. Um, NYU professors talk about our safety, right? NYU wants to build kind of a bubble, but many of us live elsewhere in the city or elsewhere um, in, in the States and they uh, commute. And so building that bubble is kind of complicated. Well, NYU has guaranteed students that they will be able to take online or live classes, depending on what they prefer. Um, so everyone is going to be guaranteed uh, that. NYU has guaranteed uh, professors that we will, be, we will not be forced to teach um, live classes. So we can have blended classes and teach from home and hopefully not even use our offices because we want to reduce density in the um, NYU campus. And administrators are now happy uh, because the uh, level of uh, deferrals that they were fearing um, did not materialize. So uh, we ended up having uh, as many students as we did uh, last year. The numbers marginally declined 
um, in, for undergrads, and we're still waiting for the numbers for um, MBA and, and master's students, but for undergrads, um, the levels of deferral um, were much lower than uh, the university fear. So I think we're still on strong footing to face uh, this, this particular year. Um, but, but life has uh, changed and will probably continue to change. The NYU uh, library is not open. It will likely not be open for the rest of the, um, of the semester. Um, we faculty members are not going to hold office hours. We're not going to have meetings with students um, um, because uh, the university is trying to prevent or to reduce uh, density. So we don't know how that will um, play out. This is going to be a very difficult semester. Um, in the uh, spring semester, we went um, online right before spring break. So half of the semester we did uh, normally, and then the other half we went um, online. Uh, this time around, it looks like we are going to start um, off, off, I mean, blended or uh, in classes in some cases, um, but uh, we will likely not uh, end up the semester um, with live uh, classes. The largest number of students in the normal regular NYU classrooms um, will be half of what it was previously allowed. So a typical classroom of 30 students will only seat about uh, 15 students. So it's, it's going to be quite a, a challenging uh, year for us. Um, the university has, uh, over the summer, um, started to prepare some classrooms so that we can have the classes um, with some students um, they're sitting in the classroom and, and with the cameras sort of set up in such a way that other people can watch the classes from home. Uh, but that's also challenging. If you have an 11 a.m. class, um, that means that it's about uh, midnight in China and, and uh, I don't know, 4 p.m. in some places in Europe. So um, having everyone in a class, either physically or online, at the same time is going to be, uh, is going to be quite challenging. Uh, other places have or are aspiring to create a bubble, but NYU is in the middle of the city, so creating a bubble in NYU is a far more difficult um, challenge uh, for us, and, and I don't know how it will play out. In my own particular case, I'm in Chile right now, but I have to fly to New York in two weeks, and um, after a two-week quarantine, I will have to uh, start teaching um, live classes. I volunteer to teach live classes, um, but we see how long uh, that uh, lasts and whether students actually show up for those uh, live classes or whether they prefer uh, not to go into the big NYU buildings where all the uh, elevators and escalators are packed of uh, people. I don't know how that will play out. Well, we wish you the best of luck in your live classes, hoping that you and all of your students stay safe. And I think we have no doubt that NYU will do the best to, to protect their students and their education. So thank you I for that. The trust levels with NYU are also uh, complicated now. So it's not just trust in institutions and state institutions, but students are complaining a lot as to whether NYU puts the well-being of the students in um, where, where, where it should be. So even NYU has issues with trust. Well, I think we're all having issues with trust these days, but hoping that you and all of your students stay, stay safe um, in the next coming months. Um, thank you, Professor Navia, so much for your time, for your insight. It's been fascinating to listen to your expertise, and um, I hope it's been enriching for everyone as much as it has been for me. So thank you so much for your time um, and for spending the evening here with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And we are proud to have you as one of our NYU alumni here in Chile as a member. Um, thank so thank, thank you. you. So thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. As a friendly reminder, um, this session has been recorded and it will be up in a few weeks. Um, online um, and we ask and we remind all of you to stay connected with us through Facebook, through email um, and through all of the social media so sources to stay informed about what we're doing and what other um, NYU clubs are doing across the globe. So thank you so much and I hope that everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye.